Hi everyone. Hi, welcome back to the channel. This is a sample video for our latest podcast episode in which we interview Sea Shepherd Captain Peter Hammerstead. Peter is the Director of Campaigns for Sea Shepherd, the international non-profit organisation whose mission is to defend, protect and conserve our oceans. He's captain of the ocean-going vessel Bob Barker and has spent more than 17 years at sea, including 10 years in Antarctica. During which time, he set the world record for the longest pursuit of a poaching vessel at sea for 110 days. His life is truly fascinating, as was hearing about Sea Shepherd's vital work and why if the oceans die, we die. It was a fascinating interview. We loved hearing his stories and you can listen to the full episode and all our other podcast episodes on Patreon, the link for which is below in the description under this video. We hope you enjoy this sample and we'll speak to you soon in the next video. See you then. Bye. I want to know, Peter, like when you're on these chases, especially that, that super long one where you broke the record, what's going through your mind? What are the emotions? Are you anxious? Are you, is it just full of adrenaline? Are you scared? What is that experience like for you? So if we use the Thunder as sort of a case study, after we found the vessel, the first thing they tried to do was to lose us in the heavy ice flows that surround the Antarctic. But thankfully, we were able to just sort of trace the warm line that the wake of that ship drew through the ice fields. And after spending about a day in the ice fields, we were able to break through to the other side. They then tried to lose us in the heavy weather that the Southern Oceans are known for. And they immediately set course for the worst storm system down in the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is renowned for bad weather because there's not much land to break up these low pressure systems that come in sort of like a runaway freight train one after the other. There's no land to break it up. So the energy just builds and builds. We then went through seven, eight, nine meter seas as we <sighs> continued to follow them through the storm. This is literally and, and my I'll, worst nightmare, Peter, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you haven't been seasick before, there's your opportunity to get seasick. <laughs> the, their next strategy was to try to wait us out. So we spent about a month just drifting along with them. And with our engine shut down, we were only consuming the fuel that our generator was, break, uh, was burning. And that was probably the most trying time, was just the uncertainty of not knowing how long we would stay at sea. And my chief engineer would come up to the bridge every single day with our fuel figures uh, for, for, for noon. And I remember looking at the figures and with just the generator running, we were burning about 500 liters of fuel a day, but we had about 400,000 liters of fuel remaining on board. So the quick calculation there is that we could theoretically, if the thunder drifted indefinitely, spend over two years at sea drifting with them. And so I went down and I spoke to Priya. She was our chief cook uh, from, from Byron Bay. <laughs> and uh, I asked Priya if we had enough food to stay out at sea for two, two years. And she said to me, we have enough rice and we have enough beans to survive at sea mm. for two years. <laughs> I gave my crew the, uh, the opportunity to disembark in that our sister ship, the Sam Simon, had just pulled in. 72 kilometers of this net and they were heading to the island of Mauritius to offload it as evidence to Interpol and so they were going to pass by our drift zone and so I said to the crew that there was this opportunity to get off if they wanted to uh, if they if they stayed on then they they had to know that we could potentially be out at sea for two years and out of 30 crew 26 decided to remain and only four left and that was very very encouraging and inspirational Wow, I'm just it? speechless. I, I probably would have been one that left. I just, I'm so nervous just hearing this story. Like my worst nightmare is drowning. I often have dreams where giant waves are crashing down on me, like tsunamis, and I, I feel so stressed even watching movies of ships out on the ocean, especially in a in a storm. I cannot begin to even put myself in that situation um so i just take my hat off to all of you and i think it's that that drive that you're doing it for such an important cause that must be like pardon the pun your anchor in these situations right. well I, I certainly think i get more scared of becoming b12 deficient than i do about drowning but uh, <laughs> every once in a while i get that, that that shock reminder that oh i need to take my daily b12 but I, I i think the more the more time you spend at sea the more comfortable you you really do get with mm -hmm. being on the ocean and you're surrounded by people who believe in the same things that you do and that 
that is empowering. And, and when we started this interview, I think you mentioned that there was there's a humility there. And I was talking mm. about how you, you do get humble when you spend time at sea. I mean, that humility comes from the fact that this chase was made possible by the galley on the Bob Barker, was made possible by the engineers on the Bob Barker. Every single person on that ship had a part to play, an equal part to play in the success of that campaign. The ship would have never left Wellington, New Zealand, and, and the Sam Simon would have never left Hobart, Tasmania, had it not been for the generosity of tens of thousands of people around the world donating their hard-earned money to put fuel into our ships. At the end of the day, the thunder sank off the coast of the Gulf of Guinea because tens of thousands of people said enough was enough and didn't depend on just government to solve all of our problems. And the reality is that I just get to be the luckiest person in the world to get to stand at the helm of that ship from time to time. I feel so uh, empowered, inspired and uplifted. And that's so important because sometimes we can get down in the doldrums that, uh, you know, it seems so insurmountable, the challenges that we face globally. But when you put it in the words that you have, Peter, it really does inspire. Yeah, I changed my mind. I'd stay on the ship. You've got me for life. <laughs> Actually, Peter, you know, last year we were 